This week I've been meditating on the life of Peter. Definitely one of God's great servants, one of God's chosen men. Uh, And even though he was one of God's chosen men, I think spiritually speaking, it's obvious that Peter was no chicken, but I do think that Peter was crippled by chicken. I think that Peter was running from a rooster. If you'll look with me at John chapter 21, we're going to begin our reading in verse number 2. John 21, verse number 2. The scripture says, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. I want to draw your attention starting here this morning I want to draw your attention to an apparent disconnect in Peter's life. Notice again Peter's announcement in verse 3. Peter says, I'm going fishing. And this is the one time I expected Matthew to say, man, but I heard absolutely nothing. I don't know, you felt on your game there. Peter says, I'm going fishing. This doesn't seem odd for a grown man and his friends who had nothing better to do than to go fishing. But there's more to this story than I think immediately meets the eye. Now, just a few years earlier, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus had seen Simon. He had seen Peter and his brother Andrew casting out a net into the sea. You remember Jesus looked at Peter and he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. The Bible says that straightway when Peter and and his brother Andrew heard this, they left their nets and they followed Jesus. On this particular occasion, when Peter says, I'm going fishing, you need to notice here, Peter wasn't just going out for a relaxing evening on the lake. Peter was essentially here going back to the life Jesus had called him to leave behind. He used to be a professional fisherman. Peter here isn't just going out for a night of fishing. He's going back to his old life. Throughout the gospel records, Peter was never at a loss for words. He was the one in the group who always, whether right or wrong, Peter was the one who always had an answer. Yet in our text, Peter seems to have very little to say. The only thing Peter really has to say, if I can paraphrase it, Peter basically says, I'm going back. I'm going fishing. Now this is the same Peter who had taken a step of faith. This is the same Peter who had walked on the water to Jesus. This was the same Peter who had witnessed thousands of people fed with a a handful of crackers and sardines. Peter was present on multiple occasions when Jesus brought dead people back to life. Peter personally knew someone, at least one person, and probably many people who were terminally ill that Jesus had made well. Peter had saw Jesus glowing with glory when he was transfigured on the mountain. Peter knew by experience that the stories about Jesus were true. He didn't even doubt that Jesus was the promised Messiah. He was God in flesh. He he was come to set his people free. This is the same man, the same Peter who said, Thou art the Christ, when Jesus said, Who do you say that I am? Peter was the same one who said, "You're, You're Messiah. You're the Son of the living God. That's Peter, but at the same time, at this point in his life, all Peter can say is, I'm going fishing. I'm going back. Contrary to his personality, John 21 paints Peter as really a depressed and a a, a defeated individual. We could surmise, some would say, well, Christ had just died, and we could say it was the death of Christ that has destroyed Peter's confidence, but that can't be it. We know from verse 1, we didn't read it, but verse 1 of John 21, we know that Jesus had risen from the dead. He's revealed himself to the disciples at least twice. He is genuinely alive and a well. So, so why is Peter in this condition? If Christ had not risen, Peter's behavior would be understandable. Of course, all his hopes, all his dreams would have been shattered beyond repair. But, but we know at this point, and Peter knows at this point, that Christ is alive. So, so why is it that Peter's going backward rather than forward? Now, I think everyone this morning would agree that Peter was no chicken, but I have a suspicion that he may have been controlled by one. Could it be that Peter couldn't gain any ground because he was running from a rooster in his past? Now, let me explain. At the end of the Last Supper with his disciples, Jesus actually announced that he was going away. And it was Simon who spoke up and uh, said, Lord, where are you going? 
Remember, Jesus answered him and said, Where I'm going, you can't follow me, but you shall follow me afterward. Look up here, John 13 and verse 37. After uh, Jesus says, You can't follow me, you can come later. Then Peter says this, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Now, I'm not sure uh, what went through Peter's mind here, but in essence, Jesus said, You can't follow me, but Peter says, Yes, I can. In essence, Peter has just promised Jesus, I will never leave thee. I will never forsake thee. Even if everyone else walks away, Peter says, I will be your friend to the end. You can count on me, Jesus. I think Peter had a bad case of the selfies. He was both self-righteous and self-reliant. He thought himself able to walk where even Jesus said he couldn't. What Peter didn't realize was that his strength was actually his handicap. His trust in his own ability was going to prove to be his weakness. Look at John chapter 13, verse 38. Jesus answered him, so he responds to Peter. He said, Peter, will you lay down your life for my sake? Peter, are you really going to? He said, most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Now, I'm not sure what went through Peter's mind when Jesus said that. I imagine knowing Peter, he's probably embarrassed that Jesus would say this in front of the others. Peter seemed to think of himself as one who lived above the possibility of failure. Even Jesus has said, Peter, you can't go. And Peter says, yes, I can. Now Jesus has said, Peter, you're going to fail. And in Peter's mind, he's saying, I am not. With confidence, with self-assurance, I'm sure Peter answered Jesus with a, a superior attitude, almost like a superior answering an inferior Peter looks at Jesus and says, look, everyone else may turn their back on you. All the rest of these, these other 11, yeah, I can see them walking away. But Peter, it says to Jesus, but you can, you can count on me. Everyone else may turn their back, but Jesus, I'll die before I deny you. You know, it's easy to make commitments like that, but it's hard to see them through. Peter's words seem to portray this typical shallow defense of someone who hasn't given any deep thought to the reality of an accusation that's been made against them. Now, how different things could have been for Peter had he just taken Jesus' words to heart. But Peter, he's proud, he's self-righteous, and he's going to have to learn this lesson the hard way. Scripture tells us that when the Last Supper, when it was over, Jesus led the disciples in a song, and, and they left the little room they were meeting in. They went to a place, a place where Jesus went all the time. The disciples knew it, and they knew it well. It was a place that Jesus went to pray, a little garden called Gethsemane. When they got to the garden, uh, the, the, most of the disciples were left, and, and Jesus took Peter, James, and, and John just a little further, and he asked them, look, watch and pray with me. I'm going to pray, and I want you to stay awake. I want you to pray with me, because he said, my soul is so troubled. During the short walk after they've left the other disciples, Jesus' demeanor began to change. His song gave way to sorrow. The burden bearer grew weak under the weight of the burden. And Jesus leaves the three sitting there, and he, he said to them, My soul is sorrowful. I am so sad, sorrowful even unto death. This is crushing me. And he looks at Peter. He looks at James. He looks at John. He says, Please pray with me. Pray for me. And Jesus went a little further, and he fell on his face, and he prayed. And you know Jesus prayed to the, the Father, Father, uh, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. But nevertheless, not, not my will, your will be done. Jesus got up from praying and he went back to where, the, where he left those three disciples and he found them sleeping. And he looks at Peter. He wakes Peter up and he said, Peter, couldn't you, couldn't you stay awake with me? Couldn't you watch with me for just one hour? Again, he looks at Peter. He looks at James. looks at John. He says, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus again went away to pray, and while he was agonizing over his approaching suffering, literally he's agonizing to the point that, that the capillaries in his, the veins in his forehead have burst, and blood is, is coming out of his sweat glands. That's the, the turmoil that Jesus is in. That's the, the suffering that Jesus is going through. And while he's going through that, Peter, James, and John are over there snoring. While Jesus was agonizing over his approaching suffering with a full stomach and a sad heart, probably troubled, probably not even troubled over what was going on with Jesus. Peter was probably more troubled about what Jesus had said to him. So Peter's discouraged. Peter is depressed. Peter, laying there, falls asleep. 
Though he swore to die with Jesus, the sad truth was he couldn't even stay awake with him for an hour. Two more times, Jesus came back and he found Peter asleep. And on the the third return, he, he came back and he said to Peter and to the disciples, Sleep on now, take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. He basically says to the disciples, just keep sleeping. No point in waking up now. Can you imagine, Peter, he's kind of, you know how it is when you first start to wake up and that first little bit of light comes in, you're kind of squinting your eyes. Imagine Peter, he, he's drowsy, he casually yawns with no sense of urgency, and as he slowly checks back into reality, he noticed that there, there's torches approaching, there's a, a whole mob approaching. The, the dark garden is now aglow with the faint flickering orange light of, of these torches. And, and Peter's probably, as he's waking up, he's confused because it wasn't this way when he went to sleep. As the fog of his midnight slumber lifted, he realized the torches were, be carry, were being carried by an armed mob led by a familiar face. He sees Judas there with Jesus, and maybe he thinks to himself, what, what's happening? Am, am I still dreaming? He looks and he thinks, why, why is Judas kissing Jesus? Why are all these people here? Are, are my eyes playing tricks on me? Uh, am I seeing this right? Are they trying to arrest Jesus? Suddenly, without warning, Peter jumped up and he jumped into action. He took his sword out and he began swinging violently with with all the accuracy of a madman. He only landed one blow. And even that blow wasn't wasn't aimed very well because all he did was cut off somebody's ear. He only landed one blow before he heard Jesus telling Peter, put your sword up. He's standing there, he's breathing hard, adrenaline's pumping through his veins. He watches Jesus as Jesus bends down and tenderly picks up the ear that he had successfully severed from the the face of the high priest's servant. He watches Jesus take that ear and and without any adhesive, without any glue, without any stitches, he watches Jesus take that, that ear and affectionately put it back, reattach it to Malchus' head. And then Peter watches as they tie Jesus' hands up and they push him out of the garden, they lead him away. At that point, all of the disciples ran for their life, except Peter. He followed the mob, but he he followed at a distance to see what would happen. When he got to the the gates of Annas' house, Annas was the father of of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. They first went to Annas' house. When they got to Annas' house, uh, one of the disciples, we don't know which one, one of the disciples knew him personally and was allowed in. So he went out and he, let the, he told the little servant girl who was keeping the gate, let, let Peter in too. I know this guy. I can vouch for him. Peter came into the little courtyard. He's trying to blend in with the mob. One of the small groups, a, a few little servants, a few soldiers, had, a few guards had lit a little fire with some charcoal and they were warming themselves and trying to get warm from the cold night air. And, and Peter kind of joined them by the blaze just trying to blend in. While he sat there warming himself, trying to go unnoticed, one of the young ladies looks at him. She's been watching him in, in the dancing firelight. She's noticed his face. And she looks at him and she says, you were, you were with Jesus. You're one of his disciples, aren't you? You can imagine Peter kind of fidgeting, not, not making eye contact, kind of like a, a nervous offender on the witness stand. Peter, Peter denies it. He says, lady, I don't know what you're talking about. You're crazy. Afraid of being found out, he he left the fire to escape the cross-examining eyes of the jury. And then another maid, another servant, who happened to be a relative of Malchus, the the servant whose ear he had cut off, she looked at him and said, she was with the mob, she said, didn't didn't I see you in the garden? Weren't you you there? And Peter answered, I swear, look, lady, I don't even know that man. About an hour later, they found Peter again. And this time it wasn't really a question. One of the servants looked at him and said, You are one of his disciples. You, you can't deny it. You even have a Galilean accent. You're one of his disciples. Your accent betrays you. And then like a cat caught in the corner with a, a pack of angry dogs approaching, Peter began to swing, if you will, but not with his fists, with his words. Peter began to curse and to swear and to say, I don't even know that man. And immediately, while he was still cursing, the Bible says that the cock crew. Daylight had come and the darkness in Peter's heart had been exposed. From where Peter stood, he could see Jesus standing trial. 
From where Peter stood, he, he knew what was going on with Jesus. And, and again, as, he, as he's uttering all of these curses, as he's getting all of these things out, he hears that bird off in the distance begin to crow. From where Peter stood, he looks over and there's Jesus standing there. And you can imagine at that moment, Jesus has already been slapped. Jesus has already been sped on at this moment. The rooster's crowing. You can hear it off in the distance. And, and as it crows, he looks at Jesus. Jesus' eyes were probably a little swollen at this point because of being slapped. And, and it hits Peter. What he said, what he did. He looks straight in Jesus' swollen eyes. And he's so ashamed as the rooster continues to crow. He runs out. He's accompanied by a flood of emotion. And the words Jesus had spoken earlier in the night overflowed from Peter's memory down into his heart. He remembers Jesus said, Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And it was true. He did. Unable to control his emotions, Peter went away and he, he wept as he, as he went. Not the tears of a corrupt politician issuing a, an insincere apology, but with violent, uncontrollable sobs of a soldier who has betrayed his comrades' positions. Peter goes out and he wept. And you can imagine there he lays somewhere in the darkness. He's broken by the, the total weight of his failure. He's tormented by the presence of his own shadow. And probably, possibly, for the first time in his life, Peter's come face to face with a monster. And it's not a monster on the outside. Outside. It's the monster that's been hiding inside of him all along. What must the crucifixion have been like from Peter's point of view? Can you fathom the shame he must have felt every time Jesus' broken face turned his way in the crowd? Can you imagine Peter? He's just trying not to make eye contact again. What guilt he must have carried as they took Jesus' body down from the tomb and he helped carry that body to the tomb. Not only was Jesus dead, not only had he denied him, but now his opportunity to make things right, it's passed away, it's all gone, there's no other chance. It wouldn't surprise me as if they laid his body in the tomb. Peter heard that rooster crow playing over and over and over again. On Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, but rather than finding a body, we know when she got there, she found a living Savior. And Jesus was risen. He commissioned her. He said, go tell the disciples. And this is interesting to me. He says, specifically make sure you tell Peter that I'm alive and I'll meet him in Galilee. Now, of course, her, her message fell on unbelieving ears because they didn't believe he was risen. But, but even Peter couldn't deny his curiosity. So he ran to the tomb to see for himself. When he arrived, he, he did find that it was true. There wasn't a body there. The linen clothes that had wrapped Jesus' body, they were laying there. The napkin that was over his face was folded up. But, but the body was gone. Whether Peter really believed or not that Jesus was risen at that point, probably not. But it was true that the body was gone. Later, Jesus actually physically appeared, specifically the scripture tells us, to Peter besides appearing to the disciples so that's kind of the backstory of what's going on here. Jesus is alive. That seems to change everything. It affirms everything he said. It's all true. Peter has seen Jesus. Yet instead of shouting the good news that Messiah had come to save his people from their sins from, from the mountaintop, why is Peter just going back to fishing? It's clear from his actions that Peter didn't yet understand what the resurrection meant for him personally. Maybe he couldn't move forward because he, he heard that, that chicken in the background. Every time he tried to go forward, he heard that, that rooster crowing in the background. I think Peter is an excellent example of a believer who can't get past his own past failures. Just like many Christians, uh, Peter, like many other Christians, I think, they believe the lie that after betraying Christ, things could never go back to the way it used to be. Yes, Jesus is alive, but Peter doesn't see that that means anything for him. One may accuse me here. You might say, well, you're operating off of some assumptions talking about this chicken. I do think there, though, is scriptural evidence to support this idea that, that Peter can't move forward because he's got a, he's got a completely wrong view of forgiveness. 
In Matthew 18, 21, remember Peter came to Jesus and he, he had this question. And this question gives insight into his attitude about forgiveness. Peter says to Jesus, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and, and I forgive him? And you remember, he, he gives the question, but then he even offers Jesus an answer up to seven times. And, and Peter really feels like he's done a good job here because he said seven times. In the, in the Jewish mind, seven was the, the number of completion. Peter is saying, how long am I responsible to keep forgiving? But even that question, think about this. The question, how long am I responsible to keep forgiving, that originates in a mind that can't conceive of forgiveness without limits, can it? It seems to me that Peter had an apparent misconception about forgiveness. Peter's question proves he believed that grace had to have a ceiling. Peter believed that mercy had to have limits. Oh, I'll, I'll forgive seven times. Peter in that was saying that he believed that forgiveness can only go so far. And I tend to believe that here Peter believed he'd exceeded his limits. Peter's failure was especially difficult, I think, for him to overcome because he knew better. He had been walking with Jesus for over, over three years. He had heard the best preaching the world had to offer. He, he had even been personally warned with a word from the Lord. Yet here he finds himself proverbially laying on the ground. He's fallen anyway. And he can't get back up. When I worked in construction, my boss always used to remind us when we were roofing, there are only two kinds of people who fall, beginners and professionals. Peter was a professional follower of Christ, and that made his fall, I think, even more embarrassing, even more difficult to recover from. Not only were there others there who heard him curse and say, I didn't know Jesus. Remember, one of the other disciples, the one who let him in, was there. He had heard it, and it's probably everybody knows what Peter had done. It's challenging to get past what someone has done to you, but I think it may be even harder to get past what you've done to yourself. It wouldn't surprise me in the least if there are some Peters in our midst this morning and you have fallen so hard you can't get up. It might have been a long time ago. It might have been recently. But you're still in your mind. You've gone back to fishing because as far as you're concerned, grace has to have its limits. Forgiveness has to have a ceiling. And like Peter, there's something genuine, something real in you that you want to live for God. You want to be a productive member of the church. But every time you, you get up enough courage to take a little ground, that, that pesky rooster in your head just keeps crowing, reminding you of all your failures. <laughs> See, roosters crow basically at three things. Number one, roosters crow at sunrise. When the, when the light starts to shine, roosters start to speak. They don't wait, if you've ever been on a farm, you'll notice roosters don't wait until the sun has fully risen or the darkness has been overcome. Roosters crow at first light and they don't stop then, they just keep crowing. Isn't this way with us, the voice of our own past failures? When, when the first rays of grace start shining into the dark recesses of our hearts, when someone stands up and preaches about the grace and the forgiveness of God, when you hear a song that, that talks about how God will reach out and God will forgive what you've done, and, and you start to see the light of the gospel, the light of the grace of God, as soon as that happens, that rooster rises up. At, at dawn's first light, the rooster rises up to remind you what you've done and to tell you it's not even worth you getting up. It's not worth you going going on. Roosters crow at sunrise, but t secondly, roosters uh, are known, yes, for crowing at sunup, but did you know they also crow when they perceive a threat? Any of you who have had chickens or been around chickens, you know that roosters, they're small, but they're fierce. I have seen roosters chase big dogs out of the yard. I know what it is to be frozen in that moment when you go in to feed the chickens and you come around, you turn around, and there standing between you and the coop door is the rooster. There are few things more scary than that moment. Because although they're little, they are territorial, and it's their territorial nature that makes them mean. And they will not only crow at, they will attack anything they perceive to be a threat, no matter how big it is. And you might think, well, what's a little chicken going to do to me? You let that rooster dig his spurs into your shin one time and you'll know those roosters in our heads are the same way they'll, they'll sound the alarm when their territory is being threatened if you start to gain a little spiritual ground they're going to get louder and louder they're going to attack you because they are territorial and they don't want to give up their roost 
In my research into roosters, I found that they not only crow in response to light and perceived threats, there's a third reason they crow, and that's just to show they're in control. Roosters crow to show their own dominance. The more victories a rooster wins, the more often they crow. And I'm sure you found that to be true in your life as well. The more we compromise, the more we give in to the voice of past failures, the more often and the louder the voice speaks. You see, cockfights may be illegal, but the, devil's, the devil has never been concerned with keeping the law, has he? Whether it's the devil or your own memory, the, the constant crow of that rooster ringing out again and again in your head will keep you cowered in the corner, paralyzed by the past. The rooster, the rooster will crow just to remind you he's in control and you're not. I can't even pretend to act like I know the hearts of everyone present this morning, but I, I do not doubt that there are probably some henpecked Christians here this morning listening who can't go forward because something in your past is holding you back. You know, the typical lifespan of a, of a chicken, unless it lives close to a Baptist, the typical, chan, the typical lifespan of a chicken is only five to seven years, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's some 30-year-old chickens here this morning. Some 40-year-old chickens that are still roosters that are still roosting and crowing in your head. It may not have been a tremendous open incident that everyone knows about like it was for Peter, or, or it might have been. It might just be your, your daily fa failures to measure up to your own expectations. You know what had to be hard for Peter was when he said, I'll never do that. And then he did exactly what he said he'd never do. If you're here this morning and you recognize that you are running from the rooster in your head, I want to offer you some hope that's found in Jesus' interaction with Peter in John 21. Now back to our text briefly. After a long night, they're out there, they're fishing, it's fruitless, they catch nothing. Jesus appears on the shore to Peter, to James, and to John. And at first they don't even recognize it's Jesus. But he, he calls out to him, have you caught anything? And, and like I would usually answer back, not anything worth talking about. But that wasn't even the answer. The answer was not a thing. Jesus says, throw your net on the other side. They did it and they, they caught a miraculous load of fish. And, and they realized, John realized when they did that, it was Jesus. According to verse 7, John recognized it was Jesus. He told Peter, and, and true to his impulsive nature, rather than just bringing the boat back to land, they're about 300 feet, about 100 yards out. Rather than bringing the boat back to land, Peter jumps overboard and swims to the shore to meet Jesus. As he waded ashore while the others are bringing the boat back. You know, and the others had to be a little bit aggravated. Here they are bringing the boat back, and Peter's man, uh, he's left his post. But Peter swam ashore, and he, he, he wades up to meet Jesus, and... When he gets there, he finds Jesus has built a little fire. He's prepared a fresh meal. Jesus invites him and the others to come and, and to sit down, and, and he served them this hot bread and fish. Now, I've never noticed this, and maybe you have, but have you ever noticed how reminiscent this scene is of the Last Supper? I imagine as Jesus passed them the bread and the fish, their minds probably had to drift back to that night, that night not so long ago when he had passed them bread, when he had passed them wine. And they, they couldn't have thought, and remember, this is only a few days later, basically. They couldn't have thought about that night without thinking about the way that they had fallen asleep, without thinking about the way that they had forsaken him when he was burdened, the way they had fallen, fallen asleep when he was burdened, the way they had forsaken when he was bound. And, and here they were, they're, they're, they're found. When Jesus comes to them, he finds them back in the boat, the boat that he had asked them to leave. There's a beautiful truth here. When Jesus invites them to come and eat, this call to come and dine, this is more than just a call to come and eat here. In, in the Middle Eastern mind, to, to share a meal was an intimate experience. You ate with your friends. You ate with your, your family. When Jesus asks them to sit down and he offers them dinner here, Jesus isn't just inviting them to dinner. He's symbolically inviting them back into fellowship. And this is so radical because Peter and the other disciples, they have, they have hurt Jesus so deeply. I'm sure they think things can never go back to the way they were. You know, when you've hurt someone or when you've been hurt by someone, no matter how much we truly do try to forgive, things rarely, or at least not without difficulty, ever go back to the way they used to be. Yet here Jesus invites them to come back to the table right where they were before they ran away. They didn't have to go back to square one. They didn't have to start over. Jesus invites these disciples to pick up right where they left off. 
And this is such a, a beautiful picture of the restoring grace of God. When we, no matter how great our sin is, when we confess and forsake our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Even the worst of the worst, cursing and saying, I don't even know him. As a child of God, no matter the severity of your sin, you don't have to spend time trying to regain or earn the favor of God. You never gained it. You never earned it to begin with. On the other side of the cross, God invites the prodigal to come home and to resume, resume his seat at the table, just like he never left. And some of them might say, well, how, how is this possible? How can we sin and then go right back into fellowship with God as if, as if nothing ever happened? It's possible because when Jesus paid for sin, he paid for all of it. He didn't just pay for your past sins. He paid for your present sins. He paid for your future sins. The blood of Jesus atones for all the sin of his people. John 21, back to our text. The scripture says, so when they had eaten breakfast, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. I think Jesus is probably talking about the fish, the fish he's gone back to. He says, Simon, do you love me more than these? Peter says, you, Lord, you know I love you. It's often been pointed out that, that the word Jesus used for love and the word Peter used are two different words. Jesus asked, do you agape me? Do you have a sacrificial love for me? Peter answered, though, I phileo you. I have great affection for you. I love you like a brother or a friend. Now, it's difficult to say why Peter used phileo rather than agape, but just think about this. I thought of the many times while I was studying that I have denied Christ in word or in deed, and how often the Spirit whispers to me, do you love me? And though my heart, through my heart, I desire, I want to say, yes, Lord, I love you. But even as I want to say that, the rooster crows in my memory. It reminds me of the wrong I've done. And though I want to say, Lord, I agape you, my own actions keep me from really even being able to confidently say, I phileo you. I kind of think that's what's going on with Peter here. Again, in, in verse 16, Jesus asked the same question. He, he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter gives the same answer. John 21, verse 17, again, Jesus asked the same question. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And Peter said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Now, there's one final thing I wish to point out to you. Did you notice here that Jesus did not reprimand Peter for his actions? Peter already felt guilty. Jesus doesn't reprimand Peter from, for his actions. Rather, three times, once for each time he had denied him, Jesus reminded Peter that he was still part of the program. Because he didn't just say, do you love me? He went on to say, after Peter answered, he said, then feed my sheep. Peter had gone back to fishing because he no longer felt worthy of being a part of the work of God, but Jesus gently reminded him that there was work to be done and he was still on the team. Just before Jesus told Peter that he would soon deny him, Jesus had said to Peter, Luke 22, in verse 31, the Lord said to Peter, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and, and when you've returned to me, strengthen your brethren. The devil, just like he wanted Job, the devil wanted Peter. And his intention was destruction, but God's intention was deliverance. The devil wanted to shake Peter up, but God was going to use the devil's actions to shake Peter out. You see, sifting purifies. It removes the unwanted and the unusable parts. Satan's sifting had done just that for Peter. It had removed all traces of self-confidence, all traces of self-reliance. Peter wasn't full of Peter anymore because Peter had been knocked out of Peter. Peter had walked away, but now Jesus wanted him back. Peter had been broken, but now Jesus wanted to restore him. Jesus told Peter, Peter, one day you're going to deny me, but when you come back to me, feed my sheep. In John 21, back to verse 20, chapter 21 and verse 19, he spoke to Peter. He told him about the day, the death he was going to die. But then Jesus said this. This is one of the final things that Jesus said specifically to Peter. Peter looked at Jesus, and, and he, after he told him about the death he would die, he said to Peter, Peter, follow me. Peter, I've already called you to do this once, and you forgot. You've gone back to fishing. Jesus is saying, Peter, lay down your nets, forget your failure, and follow me again. Peter, I'm offering you a second chance. And it was a chance Peter took, and the rest is history. 
Aren't you glad that Yahweh isn't just the God of a second chance? He is a 70 times 7 times 7 times 7 kind of God. The grace of God has no ceiling, His mercy has no limits, and His forgiveness has no end. I don't know what you did, and I don't know what rooster there is in your head that's controlling you, but I can guarantee you, you have not done anything worse than what Peter did. I believe it was Peter's fall that taught him to walk with God like an infant holding tightly to the Father's hand for support. It was only through failure that Peter could really come to understand his own need for grace and the limitless depths of God's supply. The Lord showed Peter that what he thought had disqualified him from the work was now equipping him for the mission. Having now received grace, he was ready to give it out. Remember, all through Peter's interaction with Jesus, Peter's always opening his mouth. Jesus is always correcting him. But you see this change in Peter now. Now Peter's afraid to open his mouth. Now Peter's afraid to talk about himself. Peter has fallen so hard, he has seen himself for who he is, and now he's finally at the place where he is ready to receive the grace of God. And Peter needed to receive the grace of God so that on the day of Pentecost, when he stood up and preached the grace of God, he was preaching from the overflow of experience. Peter was, went from being a man who thought grace had to have limits to being a man who was just thankful that it didn't. You may be here this morning and like Peter, you failed to live up to your own expectations. And notice I do not say you failed to live up to God's expectations. I said you failed to live up to your own expectations because that's what Peter did. God said, Peter, you're going to fall. And Peter says, I am not. Watch me. You might be here and you're like Peter and you haven't even lived up to your own expectations. You might be thinking, I've gone too far. And even though grace has no limits, even though, preacher, I agree with what you're saying, grace has no limits, I've gone too far. I'm still out of its reach. The rooster may have convinced you that things can never be the way they were, but I just want you to know that Peter would disagree. I want to tell you this morning, and I'm sure Peter would say this, the blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient to cleanse every stain of sin. Jesus has suffered your punishment, so there is no need for you to go on punishing yourself. I've heard it said, I, I know God forgives me, but you know, I just can't forgive myself. Do you realize in saying that, when you say God's forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself, do you realize in saying that you are insinuating that your standards are higher than God's standards? You're saying God's okay with me, but I'm not okay with me. In other words, I hold myself to a higher standard than God does. Do you realize in saying that God forgives me, but I can't forgive myself, you're insinuating your standards are higher than God, and not just are you insinuating that your standards are higher than God, you're insinuating that the blood is not enough. God accepts the blood as payment for your sin, the blood of Christ, but you're saying, I don't. Let me ask you something. If God has fully accepted the payment that Jesus made, why can't you? If God has put your past behind him, it's time for you to put your past behind yourself as well. And there might be someone here and you're thinking, okay, yeah, I believe that's true, but, but what about the rooster? How do I choke the rooster? How do I silence the rooster? How do I get him to be quiet? The simple answer is you expose the rooster to the lamb. Scripture says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 20, If our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. And the scripture says he knows all things. In other words, God knows what you did. He knows it more deeply. He understands more deeply what you did than your own heart does because the offense was against him. God knows all things and God is greater than your heart. In other words, the lamb is greater than the rooster. It's an amazing thing. When I try to wrestle the rooster, the rooster always wins. But when I look to the lamb, the lamb has a way of putting the chicken on the run. Say, so how, how do I silence the rooster? You don't try to silence the rooster yourself. You bring the rooster to the lamb. As we draw near to God through his word and through prayer, the, the spirit whispers sweet reminders of who God says we are in Christ. And suddenly the bleeding of the, the precious bleeding lamb, it begins to drown out the crow of that old cantankerous rooster. The rooster can crow all he wants to, but it doesn't really matter anymore because the blood of the lamb covers what the rooster represents. You say, how do I get rid of the rooster in my head? Get close to the lamb. If you're here this morning 
and you're running from a rooster, I encourage you, run toward the lamb and he will rout the rooster. It might be a great, great sin that everybody knows about like it was for Peter. Or it might just be some, some private failure that nobody knows about. You've, you've just not lived up to your own expectations. And every time you try to take a step forward, there's that rooster and he's crowing and he's crowing so loudly. Every time the sun shines, he's there to remind you he's still there. He's always reminding you the roost is his. He's always showing his dominance. What do I do with the rooster? You bring it into the presence of the lamb and let the lamb put the rooster on the run. The blood of Christ is enough to cover all sin. And the God who knows your sin better than you do, the God who knows your sin better than the rooster does, he understands the details better than you do. When the rooster crows, God is greater than our heart. When the rooster crows, the lamb, the blood of the lamb speaks louder. So if you're here this morning and you're running from a rooster, I encourage you. How did Peter silence the rooster? He started getting close to the lamb. I encourage you, if there's a rooster running things in your head, draw close to the lamb and let the lamb rout the rooster. Will you pray with me?